it's now my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, our moderator uh, for the final session. Uh, one or two of you may, may know of him, but maybe some people, it's possible some people who don't come from these shores don't. So for you, uh, John Humphreys uh, is, uh, I would say, the most feared by prime ministers downward, and I would say for good reason, interrogator uh, of people on the Today program, which is the UK Radio 4 BBC flagship news program. He's also, uh, for the last 10 years, uh, been uh, mastermind. So he's, he's the, um, the question master on mastermind, and that has a huge following. So he spent his life as a journalist, but um, what you may not know is that he's a, a, an ex darien carrot farmer, um, and his reasons for giving it up might have something to do with the bad advice I gave to him. <laughs> and uh, the, the last thing I need to do is to declare his interest, which is that when we had a discussion about whether he'd do this, uh, which is pretty big of him because he's obviously had a very busy day today, not least because he got up 10 to 3 this morning or something, is that he said, OK, well, I might do it if you... Um, if you support my African charity, or otherwise I might do it with some cheese. So you need to understand this is like questions for cheese, but in case you think that there is an inverse relationship between the degree of hostility in his questioning and any possible link, because I'm an old friend of John's, but I would say that makes my position, because I'm gonna go and sit there, more vulnerable. So please welcome John Humphreys. Thank you very much, Patrick. Yeah, what, what, he, what he didn't tell you was I bought a dairy farm. It's perfectly true, a moment of complete and utter insanity. I did buy a dairy farm, what was it, 30 years ago, wasn't it, or thereabouts? And, and it, was go it was going quite well, really, considering I had a sensible manager who believed in things like lots of nitrogen and, you know, <laughs> stuff like that, NPK, I'd, I'd never heard of it, but he knew it was good stuff and he bought it by the ton and we were doing quite well spreading this stuff all over. And then he and Peter Seger, where is he, Seger? <laughs> he and Seger, one Saturday morning, drove down my drive, introduced themselves, and from then on, disaster. <laughs> I sold up seven years later, lost a fortune, utter humiliation. It was all because of him and Sega. I'd have been fine if they'd never shown up, but anyway. But, so you did me a great favour, Patrick, thank you. I, I, uh, yeah, he, he's right about the, uh, the mastermind. I just want to pick up on the mastermind thing purely. Well, I want to make a cheap political point, obviously. That's what I do. Um, and, well, sometimes a very expensive political point. But anyway, I just want... I've been doing mastermind for the last ten years. Before that, uh, well, while I've been doing Mastermind, I also do the Today program, and I've been a political hack for um, 50 years, yes, 51 years to be exact, altogether, if you add it all up. And, um, and I said I wouldn't do Mastermind when they first asked me, because I thought that they wanted me to sit in the chair and answer questions, and I said no. Anyway, when I realised what it was, I said yes, and it's been the best decision, I have to tell you, that I've ever taken, um, which was I discovered that you had two programmes one, you know, the day program, and you have mastermind. And all these years of interviewing politicians on today program, now I'm asking questions of people on mastermind who actually want to answer the questions. <laughs> and, and I have to tell you, it, it's so refreshing. It, everything. Although, I, I look, a very quick thing, I'm not going to bang on, but just to, they say warm me up, you don't seem to need much warming up. But anyway, um, you, on Celebrity Mastermind, we do a celebrity version of the programme Mastermind at Christmas, and you get some slightly weird answers to the questions, because they're there, I suspect, the people who do it, the contenders are there more for their, as it were, celebrity than their master mind, if one doesn't be <laughs> too unkind. So I'm going to test you, all right, very, very quickly, on a few of the mastermind, celebrity mastermind questions, see if you can get them. And the reason I want to do this is because some of these bizarre answers we've got, I just want to see whether you are better than, well, you know what I mean. Anyway, first question, this was from, uh, the answer came from a um, soap star. It was last year, I think, on the program, you may have seen it. And I asked him, here's the question, and you're going to answer it, all right? I asked him, what... <laughs> you're not allowed to do that on Mastermind, I can tell you. <laughs> Nor indeed on the Today Pro. I, here's the question, all right, ready for it? What breakfast cereal do you associate 
with prison? Yes, very good. His answer, Cheerios. <laughs> good. Could never quite decide whether he was making a deeply ironic comment on the <laughs> penal system or what, anyway, or whether he was just bloody thick, I think probably the latter. Right, you did well, three more, very quick ones. This time, though, the guy was not a soap, soap opera star, he was a politician, a rather eminent politician, all right? So here we go, three very quick questions. More difficult than the last one, admittedly, but nonetheless. Who succeeded Henry VIII? Edward the, what? Edward the Sixth. Edward the Sixth is absolutely right. If somebody out there said Edward the Sixth, absolutely right. Not as he said Henry the Seventh. <laughs> what was the name of the prison in Paris that they stormed in 1789 at the, during the revolution? Yeah, not Versailles. <laughs> and, and these are all absolutely genuine. And the surname of the lady, uh, French lady called Marie, who uh, discovered radiation. Not Antoinette. <laughs> and the, the, guy, the guy's name is David Lammy. He was, you'll know him exactly, spoken of as a future prime minister. He was. Um, and he was at the time Her Majesty's Minister of State for Higher Education. <laughs> Something pleasing about that, isn't that? Anyway, that's a complete, well, it's not a complete diversion because the uh, proposition, the question, if that's right, that we're addressing today is, is a tricky one and admits of many more, I suspect, admits of many more answers than a typical mastermind question would. And I'm still trying to get my head around it because we've had a number of um, not entirely, admittedly, sober um, dinners where we, Sega, him, me and one or two others, where we tried to talk about this, me with my sceptical hat on. I have to say he's completely failed to persuade me on any level. That's because he keeps going off into other admittedly important areas, but I can't begin to get a grip on them. So the idea of this session, I think, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, but then it's too late now because I'm here, uh, is that, that we will explore the issues that have been raised today and indeed in the last couple of days, if you've been around for the last couple of days, See whether there's general agreement. I suspect there will be, looking at the panel. I rather suspect there will be. Um, but let's try and tease out what are the crucial areas, the things that have got to be sorted out if you're going to make the kind of progress that you want to make. Um, and I, um, as Patrick will tell you, have to be seen, he's already suggested this, have to be seen as a um, skeptic at the very least, cynic at the at the very worst, but more skeptic than cynic, it has to be said. So let me just introduce you to our panel. You know him, so I won't introduce him again. Um, Richard, uh, Richard Madison, who's chief executive of True Cost UK, so you get a sort of idea. Just a quick word about True Cost UK, Richard. Um, we spent 13 years putting a price on externalities and applying that in a business context for businesses, policymakers, and pension funds. Right, so not just food, but more broadly. Yeah, but, but food as well? Yeah, food right. as well. All right, okay. Externalities, there's a word that sings, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> forgive me, forgive me, but we'll get there later. Ellen, uh, Ellen Gustafsson, look, we have a woman on the panel. Hey. Yeah. A woman, yeah. You'll know things have changed when it's all women except for the lone man sitting in the middle. Anyway, Ellen Gustafsson, who is the co-founder of the Food Tank, which is a think tank, um, and you weren't all where you used to be in fashion. I did. I used to run a small fashion brand that raises money for school feeding programs around the world called Feed. And, and now um, your food tank does what? Connects the global and the domestic issues of both food and agriculture and gets people, the public, um, thinkers, to, to really look at both sides of the coin. Because a lot of times we silo the issues of domestic food issues and international. So really trying to bring them together. Okay. Um, Henry, you, I think, know Henry Robinson. He is... Uh, the very new couple of weeks, Henry? Couple of weeks. Um, the boss, uh, president, I should say, of the Country Land and Business, so CLA, you CLA. might know it as for donkey's years. Yep. And you're a farmer. I'm a farmer from Gloucestershire, yep. Yeah, um, you are a farmer who you think looks more like an accountant, I, really. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't usually look like an accountant, but well, uh, I spend a lot of my life on a tractor, that's certainly true. You do. When you're, when you're not in London? When I'm not in London, yeah. Right, I yeah. assume you don't go trundling around Hyde Park just to I keep your <laughs> hand in or something. Yeah. Um, we, we will not, <laughs> quite, we'll come back to you. Uh, we'll come back to all of you. And uh, Peter Blom, you know Peter, I think, um, who's chief exec of Trudos Bank in Holland, an ethical bank. Yeah. 
and I'm going to try very, very hard not to make the cheap point that the co-op is an ethical <laughs> bank as well. <laughs> That's all. I'm not going to say right. anything. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> not going to make that point. That's, that, that's it. Right. Um, but you're all right, are you? I mean, you don't have a chairman who does a bit of the, you know. Uh, no, no, no. We have a very brave chairman, so uh, that goes very well. <laughs> and he's uh, not a Baptist or a Methodist minister, no, is he? No, no, no. He's, 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 he's a banker as well, so. He's a banker as well, <laughs> my God. Oh. Right. I mean, that was the only good thing about the other man, Mr. Flowers, yeah. that he wasn't a banker. He was. But anyway, um, right, um, difficult to know where to start, but let's, the word sustainable on account of it's sort of out there, let's just see if we can get agreement on what sustainable is. And by the way, feel free to come in, obviously, I only do invite you, I suspect, knowing if, if you're, lots of you are farmers and in the food business, you, uh, you've got fairly strong views anyway, so you will, I dare say, wish to make them. I'm not going to allow you to make speeches, but do pile in with questions and all that sort of thing. But come on, let, let's see if, um, if we can get a handle on what is, in the sort of language that the public would understand, what is sustainability. Um, and I say that in, the, in this context, because I can imagine, I mean, I'm, I'm a journalist, obviously, and uh, we don't have many laws in journalism, many rules, but we do have one, it's a very simple one, and it says, first simplify, then exaggerate. And <laughs> as you will know, that's one we observe religiously, the only one we observe religiously. And, and the exaggerated version of sustainability, indeed the exaggerated version of what you're trying to do here today, true cost accounting, would be something like a headline in the Daily Mail that says, um, why they want to push up the cost of your food basket or something. I mean, that's, that, that's the way this would be seen. So, and, and you have to answer that by saying, well, you've got to understand sustainability is vital for the future of the planet, and they say, I'm going to stuff about the planet, I'm worried about feeding my kids at a price I can afford. So, in that context, what is sustainability? Go on, you, you're dying to get in, but you're only allowed 10 seconds. Go. <laughs> Producing food in such a way that it'll protect the interests or not compromise the interests of future generations. <laughs> That's it. I thought you wanted to. I seconds. did. I'm just gobsmacked that you actually did. That's the first time I've ever had a one answer. Anyway, one yeah, sentence the, answer. The only difference I would say was didn't would say didn't prejudice the ability for future generations to produce food. Don't prejudice the ability for future generations. To produce food. More than just to produce food, to be healthy, Indeed. to live yeah. in a yeah. climate which is yeah. All right. Richard, do you consider yourself to be a sustainable farmer? You use chemicals. Um, Henry in this context, but it's okay, I'll answer to, <laughs> I'll answer, I'll answer to anything. <laughs> That's I was looking round for Richard. Um, Forgive me. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I've, right. been, I've been up since the it's all right. no, it's okay. middle I, of I, the night. I, 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 I wasn't I wearing my glasses. I understand. I'll, I'll put my glasses back on again. All right. Yeah. <clears throat> all am, right. I, am I sustainable? How about you as well, Henry? Then? The, 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 answer, the answer is, I hope so. I hope so. We've been farming. I've been farming all my adult life um, since 1978. We, I, I can't tell you, though, whether we're doing things now, because I, I don't see any of us can know the answer to this, that is suddenly going to impact in future generations. Because, for example, I mean, I apply nitrogen, you say you gave it in your introduction at the start about your dairy farm. Um, you know, we are reliant on, on, on bag nitrogen. I'm, I'm not an organic farmer. There's every chance that the Cotswolds, where I farm, which didn't, didn't um, produce any arable crops in the 1930s, we'll be back to not producing arable crops in the 2030s. So I can't tell you if it's sustainable, but it is at the moment, but how long is sustainable? Well, it, it might an answer be it'll be sustainable in terms of producing food so long as you provide the chemicals. I mean, that's, that's a very, very simplistic... Yes, I mean, the, uh, it, is, it is quite simplistic, and, and the answer is, at the moment, it is sustainable, yes. But whether... Do you mean economically sustainable? Economically you mean economically yeah. sustainable. You can sustain yeah. Yeah. The, the production of food at a price that gives you enough yeah. money to live on? More or less. More or less. Yeah. And that 
means you can sell it, or rather the customer can buy it at a price they can afford, more or less. Yes, I mean, we can get into a whole conversation about the volatility of farm prices, and it was mentioned earlier on today. And it's one of the things that makes trying to plan for the future and plan future cash flows almost impossible. I mean, I've, always, I've given up now trying to, trying to put in a sensible price because you never know where the price is going. Mm. Um, Richard, your, your answer to that would be what? True cost would be what? Um, in terms of the sustainability question, what is sustainability? Mm. I would expand on what Patrick has said, so um, doing things today that preserves the world for future generations, but also not compromising the poor today because I, I do a lot of travel in Asia and I've just been for six weeks in Asia and, and what the common complaint there is sustainability means lack of growth for us. So we need to find ways of enabling poorer countries to grow in a way that is sustainable as well as um, governing our own behavior for future generations. Hmm. I'm not sure whether that takes us very much further to be perfectly frank. I mean, where, um, where does true cost fit in then? Where does that fit into the picture? I mean, I would say that if you take account of the full costs of production, which are not just the market prices, but the other impacts that are being borne by society, and if you can still make a profit as a business after those costs are accounted for, then that could be deemed to be sustainable. So if you had a profit and loss statement and an environmental profit and loss statement and a social and a human, and cap human capital statement, and if you stack all of those things up and there's a net benefit somehow, financial benefit, um, social benefit, and net net it all works, then that's sustainable. But the essence of the proposition here today, as I understand it, is that the way we are doing it collectively, and we can exclude Henry from this, if you wish, although you may not wish to, um, is that what the way we're producing food at the moment is not sustainable in the context that, that uh, Patrick supplied. Um, and therefore, you have to take the costs of that food production and add it on to the price that we pay for that food. I mean, that's, is that more or less what we're saying here? Well, no, I disagree with that, actually. <laughs> you disagree with that? I don't think Do that's... you disagree with that, Patrick? I do. Yeah, all right. Anybody agree with it before we move on? No. <laughs> I, I, I disagree with it because that's what we tried to do. And it didn't work because if you, if you can't find a better way of being accountable for the costs other than just putting them all on the price of the, f of the food system, which is trying to be sustainable, you end up self-limiting the number of people who can afford to buy the food at that price. So the whole of the discussion today has been to try to work out how we can do it in a more intelligent way, which will be possible to, for, the, for the whole farming community and indeed all the people who buy food to live with. That's the exploration. Because if you simply do what we did, write some organic standards, charge a premium, we've seen what happens. If you're really generous, it's 2 3% of the market. And so you ran the Soil Association for however many years, 20, 25 years. Um, you got it wrong. I think it, I, I admitted to uh, drunk some San Francisco water and possibly had an attack of naive over-optimism 30 years ago. And I now see that unless we change all our food systems, we're not going to have a planet that's fit to live on. So oh, that's, that's, a, that's a different argument, because you were arguing 30 years ago that you have to change all your food systems. The, the question is whether uh, what you got wrong was assuming that it could be done I, I don't with the right sort of will and the right political and all that. You no longer believe that if it I'm can honest, be done? If I'm honest, I didn't understand the science uh, of externalities of true cost accounting then. I, did, I, I knew that the polluter didn't fully pay, but it was, a, it was an inadequate understanding of the sheer scale, which I've been learning about actually even during today, of the way, the distortion of the current economic systems. Because it just doesn't value all the ecological capital and the pollution and all the rest of the consequences of, of some but, farming but, systems. But the, the, the economic system is, is an abstract. What are you, in, in, in practical terms, what are we talking about? Yeah. Well, I think for a relatively small group, uh, a true, true cost is a reason to, buy, to pay a higher price. 
for a small group who can get it, who see why that is important. But for the mass consumer, it's not. They look at the price the point. and they can afford it, yes or no. But that doesn't mean that you should, should stop there. You should use it on a more system level and discuss with your colleagues, with people in the market, with government, is this not a reason to put incentives or constraints to it so that we can level up the whole price and create a level playing field? Level up the whole price? Maybe it has to be higher, but then for everybody. Or maybe others should pay more who pollute more. In that sense, you get a better comparison for prices. And so, so under that system, uh, you, would <laughs> you would actually pay more for food it would be a complete reversal of everything that's well, actually could, been happening it, it, in practice. You would pay even, more for food that had been produced sure. with loads of chemicals and less for that which had been produced it organically. Could even, it could even be the other way around, that maybe organic food or sustainable food goes down and other food goes up. But given that 95% of our food is produced chemically, for want of a better shorthand, yep. um, that would mean the vast majority of the consumers, horrible word, people in, this, in the world would pay more for their food. Well, I, th I think. Or this what? I'm sorry. Or make it sufficient. Or, or, or not compete by chemically. Oh, yeah. well, or how can they do that when there's not enough uh, organically produced food out there, which well, there isn't? I, I think. Well, I think. I think what? something we have to remember is that this is not. This is not a short term. This is not a short term problem, and it's not a short term solution. And I think, you know, when, 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 I, when a, a friend of mine who doesn't understand food systems or is, doesn't work in food systems asks me what I'm doing here in London, I say quite frankly, when we go to the grocer, we should be able to see the healthiest food options for us that also probably are the healthiest food options for the planet be priced in a way that's the healthiest for the consumer, eater, person. Mm. <laughs> um, so, so that the least healthy for us, the McDonald's hamburger, should actually be some, something we don't know yet, maybe $10 which would mean you wouldn't be able to eat it every single day. And you'd have to eat it more infrequently. But who makes this judgment as to what is the healthiest food option? Well, I think, I I mean, think that, that's exactly huh? what the accounting is. That's what the, this, this system of accounting is needed for, to develop the new metrics. Right now, there's one metric in agriculture. That's yield. And yield is not a sufficient metric to make a population of healthy humans a, a healthy planet or, or anything. Well, it's a pretty important one. If your kids are hungry and you're living in a part of the world where you can't get food, it's a pretty damned important one. Well, I'd sooner have rubbish food that costs the rest of the world. It's always like food might feed my kids. And having worked at the UN World Food Program, I understand those issues, but I'd also say most of those mothers would want their children to have enough vitamin A, enough iron, enough iodine, and not just enough calories. Yeah, but and they'd so want to be able to buy it every week. <laughs> but, um, they would also, though, want to be able to buy it at a price they can afford. Absolutely. And you've got, <laughs> you've got to find a way of producing the food, therefore either produce the food at a price they can afford or find some magical way, and it does seem to me to be mysticism, to find some magical way of attaching all those externalities to a certain category of food. And I'm... Well, that's what we were exploring earlier, because we heard this morning about endocrine disruption and about health treatment costs. And if, the, if we could establish beyond reasonable doubt through good scientific data that the rapidly escalating cost of the health service is in part attributable to changes in agricultural practice, which is what we were being told this morning, and put a price on that, then you could say that instead of the c consumer uh, p uh, buying apparently cheap food, you actually charge uh, at some point for the cost, the damaging health costs downstream to the, to the chemicals or whatever it is that cause right. those, and that has the... You know, did, the, your, um, did your speaker this morning tell you what the biggest reason for the increasing cost of the NHS is, and that is that people are living longer? Uh, it's rather did, difficult to square that with the idea that eating this sort of food is driving them into hospitals, isn't it? Uh, he didn't mention that, but... No, funny if, that. Uh, but he did... Yeah. Well, uh, living longer but not well. There's not a shred of evidence for that. Not a shred of evidence for that. The fact is, no, no, that, that's, I mean, that's not, <laughs> by, 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 some, by some data estimates in the United States, there's some, uh, up, I mean, there's billions of dollars of directly related obesity costs in the U.S. healthcare system. And, and those, are, those are, sure, amortized over people's longer lives because they're being kept alive with drugs, but there's certainly still costs that are embedded in all of that healthcare that they need for the rest of those 
20 years that they're living on statins. <laughs> I mean, uh, so I, I think, I think th again, that's metrics that we really don't understand yet. Why is there a difference between statins and broccoli? That those, I, I, honestly, because there is massive funding in the pharmaceutical industry to tell us exactly what statins theoretically so do. So there's a great conspiracy out there, is there? And we're all so it's, stupid. It's, it's, a, it's a very simple system. It's, it's that pharmaceutical companies have a great lobby and broccoli producers don't. <laughs> that simple. <laughs> yeah, in a second. In a, uh, uh, it, it, it's an interesting notion. Um, um, <laughs> All, all, almost as interesting as the fact that, as far as I can tell, and this is not a cheap point, well, it is a cheap point, but I'll make it anyway. I'm a journalist, I'm allowed. Um, that, as far as I can tell, there's not a single person in this room who takes issue with what you guys are saying, apart from me, and I'm doing it because, I nearly said, because I'm paid to. Well, I'm not actually, I'm doing it for free. But anyway. <laughs> just, just, well, for, for cheese, all right, I'm doing it for cheese. <laughs> but not much, frankly. No. no. <laughs> You're right there. Uh, yeah, yeah, quite. Um, but no, look, look but, but it's, it, it's, it's, it's a serious point, this. The fact, what you're doing, and there's no, maybe there's not a problem with this, but I actually think there is quite a big problem. You're talking to yourselves. You're preaching to the converted. You all buy this message. Your reaction to everything that's been said up here is perfectly, you know, absolute proof that you all buy into this basic proposition. Why is there nobody, nobody on the panel let alone anybody in the hall. Why is there nobody taking you on? Two possible reasons. One is because they are overwhelmed by the force and the logic and the power of your argument. The other is they can't be bothered because they know it's pointless. Can I just say, though, yeah. that um, the people that aren't in this room are the lobby that is taking it on that is the business as usual. That's the first point. And secondly, um, when an organization like Unilever says they saved last year, last financial year, they saved 300 million euros um, by buying sustainable agricultural commodities, what they mean is sustainable agricultural commodities are cheaper for them than normal agricultural commodities. And that is because well, of the... What's normal? What's normal? The normal market for agricultural commodities. So, and that is, the reason for that is actually that what is happening over time is we have these non-linear and very disruptive events that are created by floods and droughts that impact on the price of commodities in various different parts of the world. And when it impacts on a highly risky area where a particular agricultural commodity is produced, the price for that commodity globally goes up because they're all interconnected, in effect, in a market. And so the savvy organizations like Unilever and plenty of others are actually bypassing that commodity market and gaining some commercial advantage by buying cheaper and sustainable commodities. Now, that is not sort of an on-the-farm organic approach. That's a market approach, but it's working for them. That's because we live in a market economy. Yeah. Hi, I'm the speaker from this morning. Oh, hello. Hello. Thank you. This has been very interesting. Thank you for I leading a very vigorous discussion. But it's simply a myth that all of the increase in cost of health care are due to the fact that we are I aging. Didn't say, I didn't say all. I said it, most of it. No, not even most of it, because if you look at the major increases in the cost of health care, they come about because of cardiovascular disease, because of type 2 diabetes, because of obesity, strokes, strokes cardiovascular disease. And these are all, all those estimates are adjusted for age. These conditions are increasing much more rapidly at younger ages than they ever did before. How, how old are you? I'm about as old as you. I'm seven. <laughs> you know? I'm well, obviously, the difference is, is I'm not ashamed of being 70. How old are you? I'm 64. The Beatles right. just sang about me. Right, OK. So you're 64. Um, at the turn of the last century, you'd have been dead by now, wouldn't you? Yes, oh, I would. The odds uh, oh, I agree. Been... People so... are living longer, but they're living with health conditions that are very much more costly than they used to be. I haven't got any. Have you? You don't think no, so? No, I'm healthy, too. That's because I avoid chemicals. I don't. Well, then, then you have a genotype that's particularly helpful, and you should share that information with all of us. <laughs> anyway, you should check, talk to some health economists about that. Thank you. Stanley, give, give the mic to Stanley there. Well, just very quick, I spent years in the European Parliament setting up a group called um, the Group on Animal Welfare, and we tried to get animal welfare legislation. You asked your panel what they meant by sustainability. 
in farming. I didn't hear any of you mention animal welfare. You talked about future generations of human beings. But what about these animals, for heaven's sake? Yep, that's part of it. It is. And we were sticking into the safe territory because it's less easy to put a, to put a price on the suffering of an animal, but, but Stanley's absolutely right. It should be a central part of it. But, but what we think is that even if you take the most easily priceable damage into account, it would have a dramatic effect on removing some of the distortions in the current pricing of food systems. All right, and what's the main what distortion then? Give, give me um, an illustration of the main distortion, the main distorting effect, and, and presumably you'd say the CAP, would you? Maybe, Margaret Henry, or, or whatever, I don't know. I was, I was, sorry, I was going to answer a different question. That was the problem with the one that you asked earlier on about the, about, about the externalities. And, and I was thinking that there is just a, just a slight movement towards uh, uh, understanding this whole concept from government. And I, you remember the Natural Capital Committee that was started the other day? It seemed to me to be talking about setting up an accounting system which was really very close to your true cost accounting. I have to tell you, I don't think I understand either of them. But, but it is a general movement in that direction, which, if it's picked up, and if Dieter Helm of the Natural Capital Committee reports on it and actually sets up the system with some clarity, seems to me that it will bring some of this about, and it's nothing to do with what you've tried to do today, it's, it's happening already. Can I, can I just make a really quick suggestion? Sorry. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, as just tell us who you are. Oh, I'm Three Stoll. I'm from Incredible, Incredible Edible Lambeth, which is a, an organization in Lambeth which is working on uh, food and health issues. Um, as an intermediate step between uh, inclu at increasing the price of food to uh, account for externalities, how about a system of labeling which um, so when you buy something that uh, has huge externalities, the consumer uh, can make a choice about what they buy. Mm. Do, do you believe, and, and it is a skeptical question, obviously, um, but do you believe that, as politicians insist on calling them, the hard-working people of this country? <laughs> it's, not, it's not possible any longer, is it, to refer to people without, or politicians, without putting hard-working in front of them. Uh, anyway, maybe they are all hard-working, maybe they are. Um, but do you believe that they, when they, you know, the mother with a couple of kids or whatever it is, and she's struggling to make, and all that, you know the argument as well as I do, and she wanders around the supermarket, and the kids are screaming, and she's only got 20 quid to buy whatever she, and she's going to look at the things, oh, right, well, the external costs of that are X, Y, and Z. I'm not going to buy that two quid chicken, I'll go and buy something that costs four times as much. Um, I don't think it's an instantaneous change. I think it's a slow burn. I think it's a, a process of education and of people starting to, you know, with the storm surge today. People are, it's, it's tied into issue of, into persuading people that climate change is real and that we live in a system. We don't, we're not just individuals acting without effect. Mm. I, I also it's, it's an issue of, I mean, it's basic supply and demand if we want to use the market economic framework. I mean, 10 years ago, if somebody said to you that, everyone, that there would be more Africans with cell phones than there are Americans, you would think they were nuts. It would be way too expensive. They wouldn't be able to afford that. And if they had extra money, they certainly wouldn't go buy a cell phone. And now we know that the way a lot of innovation does work is when some early adopters, like are already happening, you walk down the street in London and the, the, the Pret, Pret coffee shop is advertising organic coffee. That's, um, a, that's a ten year change. Ooh, that, that's a bit of a leap, that, isn't it? The reason no. they want, well, the no, reason. It's, 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 it's Apple cell phones or organic apples, it's a similar thing. Oh, well, I'm, mm, maybe, but the reason they want organic, uh, the reason they want, I can say organic cell phones, the reason, <laughs> the, the reason they want cell phones is because there is an instant, and I mean literally instant change, if you're a poor producer living in a mud hut somewhere in the back of beyond, your life is instantly changed because you've got an instant market that you can respond to. And it's a complete, I've lived and worked in Africa for years, I've got a, I run a little African charity called Kitchen Table Charities Trust, very, very good charity, <laughs> commend it to you. Um, uh, and, and, and that's why cell phones had an instant and ongoing, dramatic, revolutionary, wonderful effect on what's happening on the continent of Africa. Had, it wasn't instant. It's, it started well, in the West and it moved. Well, quite. it took a few years. That's what I'm talking about. If you're suggesting that this revolution, 
because that's what you're talking about, is going to take a few years, then, wow. Well, we um, described it as a revolution in evolutionary steps. <laughs> <laughs> you would. <laughs> And it is. Come what, on, what, Patrick. What, what we're really talking about, what Ellen is talking about, <laughs> you is you can't a, have a revolution in even recent. What we're talking about is a theory of change. And you and I have discussed this. You know, yeah. the, it's the question in front of us all. What are the preconditions? In fact, we had a fascinating conversation yesterday with Lord Stern here about what are the interventions, the points of intervention which precipitate big change. And you're right. This is long term, and it's like the frog in the water, isn't it? If you change things Keep slowly, the erode the soil, <laughs> destroy biodiversity. Nobody notices, it's too long term, it's out of political time, so nothing happens. So what are we going to do about it? Are you saying you don't care about the fact that we're destroying all the soils and the biodiversity? Well, remember, I am being a devil's advocate here, Patrick. You have to remember that. <laughs> okay. So I can say anything I want without any degree of responsibility at all and pretend that I'm just... Um, and I do, I can, can we make a... What? Sorry. What? Sorry to interrupt. Can we make a quick housekeeping request? If we're going to take some comments from the audience, can we invite people to come and stand here if they'd like to oh, say right, something? Oh, right, if that's the way you do it. Otherwise, if we're not pointing people out, they can't bring up the microphone. Oh, fine, so do, that do, we can by all means, yeah, do that. So, are, are you people waiting to say something? I oh, right, okay. There's quite a lot of people do, do, <laughs> like do, to say go, something. Go, go ahead then. I thought you were writing on the. I, I, was, I thought you were setting up some kind of dating agency. <laughs> 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 <What's that? laughs> I just had a kind of comment. Um, I went to a talk in Oxford the other day about food governance and everything, and I can't remember the name of the speaker, so I'm going to embarrass myself by just saying. Certainly. The wonderful ladies talked about automated and reflective behaviour in food choices, and how nowadays we go into a supermarket, as you said, and we literally just see something and automatically take it. Everything that you're talking about is reflective. We're thinking about future generations, we're thinking about sustainability, thinking about greenhouse gases. As a young person with no time on my hands, I think automatically about food. How can we change that to a reflective? Because we're not going to get any action if not. Mm. That's, yeah. mm. Mm. But it's interesting that you distinguish between those two. Yeah, ab absolutely. And, and if you're the, the hard pressed mother with half a dozen kids in tow, then. <laughs> you're, go on then. Make, 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 make it quick. Go on. Oh, no, no, just you're talking to me. Oh, I see. No, no, no. No, no, I was, I, was, I, was, I was reflecting on the fact that it's, as, it, as you acknowledge, you're young and maybe don't have kids. Well, no, I don't. Right, exactly. So there is a difference. You'd, you'd accept that, that. I mean, you going into the supermarket, as you said, reflective. And, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, that, that. Hello? Yeah. My question. Um, hello, John. Um, uh, I, I, I wanted to stand up because I've got a very numb bum, that's one thing. Um, the other thing is we're, it, it just feels like a bit of ping pong going on here. Um, and uh, I suppose my point is on behalf of farming generally, which is um, really on its knees. And I think my, my definition of sustainability is to endure without giving way. Well, it's not mine, it's from the Oxford Dictionary, I looked it up once. But, so we need a system that endures without giving way, and I think it's what we all, as farmers, need to aspire towards. It's, it's not an organic, it's, well, it is an organic matter, but it also concerns conventional farmers as well. I feel a bit sorry for Henry up there, as A, I know him, and B, I know his farm, which is a lovely farm, full of all sorts of conservation features and permanent pasture and everything else, and Henry is farming in a very sort of standard way for the Cotswolds, which makes a bit of a thin living, and I think the same applies to organic farming. It is, it's the, the whole of agriculture globally is on its knees financially. Uh, why is that? We talked about corporations, and that is definitely the big part of the problem. So what is the big part my, of the problem? The part of the problem Precisely. is the amount of money that is being siphoned out of agriculture uh, by supermarkets, by the corporations, that needs to go back into farming because farmers are unable to reinvest. It's not just... So, a question of the UK, it's a global issue, there's a huge and increasing um, disparity between what the farmer gets and what the, 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 the companies oh. not involved with farming sure. get, and how do we uh, see a way of sorting that out? They're incredibly powerful, their advertising is very powerful, yep, yep. and they control everything that we do. But, and uh, but, but it, it isn't the answer, and this is not intended to be a ping-pong thing, but isn't the answer that you, collectively, um, have to get together, use your own muscle to the extent that you have muscle, and put pressure on those people who are buying your products. The snag then is that there are other people who, who can produce much more cheaply than you because they've got 
Uh, I think, no, I, it, that's a fair point, and we always talk about cooperation, but the realities are that there are some farmers that are very entrepreneurial and that will do that. But for the majority of farmers, they are hard-working people in a genuine sense of the no, way. They're working harder and harder, well. running faster and faster, making less and less, and they're getting older and older. These are all issues that actually threaten food security and that we need to act on. And that having very recently been at a large supermarket uh, producer's day, um, I nearly drowned in the sort of corporate smugness of mutual backslapping uh, that uh. went on uh, during that. And they are sadly very out of touch. They really don't get farming or sure. agriculture to make sure. it sound more Peter. flash. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Anyway. Peter. Well, I think what you see, what I see in our practice in financing farms, the ones who are successful turning their back really to their farm and looking at the consumer and be an entrepreneur and be active and then engaging the consumer directly and I think the problem is very much that they look to the other side. The consumer really picks something from the supermarket, runs out and the farmer only look at his own farm and we should try to connect the two again and the middle where the most money has been made so far, we can make shortcuts there and that's where we have to be creative we can finance that sort of corporation, but if we don't do that and we allow the middle to stay there and make a lot of money, then both ends, the consumer and the producer, they will suffer. I mean, that will continue if we not connect in a creative way. Can, mm. can I make... No, no, no. Yeah. come in, would you mind, sorry, because we've got a whole... Look, there's about 20 people behind you, all desperate to make a quick point. At least you'll have yeah. to make Hello. quick points. My name is Darko Znaur, I come from Croatia, and uh, I'm an agri-environment consultant. And I would like to ask you a question. Uh, Don't know is the when, when was the last time when you were at the supermarket, or I, I assume you paid a food that you eat, isn't it? I, I buy my food from a little local market in Shepherd's Bush, as it happens. Excellent, but, uh, excellent. Do you think you paid the true cost of price then? I haven't got a clue. All I know is it's a downside cheaper than it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 sure. years ago. Sure, great. Uh, when you paid your tax, do Actually, you... the truth is mostly I get it free from Peter Seger who drives yeah, up to Right, London. right, right. <laughs> do you think that you Even paid... Better, do, better are you food. aware? Are you aware that you also paid in your tax a portion for cleaning up the mess, yeah. environmental mess that has been made by the uh, uh, I, agriculture? I, I'm, I'm completely aware of that, uh, but um, uh, forgive me for saying so, but that's a bit of a patronising question, but, uh, but, uh, but, but I do that all the time. So right, uh, and, and, and the next... <laughs> and, no, my, my point but, is... But I am aware of it, but since we've got limited time, what, what, what's the question? No, I'm not, you know, sure, I'm not fine, 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 okay, you but, don't like questions, sure. I'm, I'm very no, happy to have no, questions. No, 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 that's, that's <laughs> but, fair enough. But my, no, my, my, my point is... My, my point opinion is, is not worth your... That's the point I'm really making. So let me make my opinion then. I'm just a hired... Hack, it, really. uh, what? Food externalities do exist, yes. and we do pay them, we do eat them, we do drink them, and we do breathe them. And it's a, uh, I would like to demystify the idea that it would become that the food become more expensive, because we do pay them as a uh, when we come at the supermarket cashier, when we pay taxes and also when no, we go to no, hospital. No, of course, which so is the whole they, point of this. they do exist, and yeah, yeah. regardless whether we uh, deny them or, or not, they do exist as a real cost. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, of course. I mean, that's, that's a given. That's the whole point of being here, isn't it? That I'm sort of aware of that. Yeah. The question is what you do about it, not whether they exist. The question is what you do about it. But, uh, yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Johan Bakker from Leiwagening University in Holland. And I'd like to add some figures, if I may. Um, make it quick. In our country, we had about 35 years of supermarket war now, just starting a new one because Albert Heijn wants to increase his market share, which actually learned us that uh, the consumer has learned that he doesn't have to pay for his money. He has learned that he has to pay for his new apple because that's 800 euros and they can afford it. If you uh, make a differentiation between consumers, you will see 7.5% of consumers will pay for organic either the price, whatever the price. About 20% can't afford anything, buy the cheapest. And the potential's in between. If you tell a fair story and you give them information about what the true price of a product is, you will see that they will learn to pay more for true All right. food. Okay. I want to add one small thing. We have 29 countries in our Euro European Union. Every year, we take a bag of food 
and they calculate the average price. The average price in all Europe is 100%. Denmark, 145%. They pay 45% more all than right. the average of Europe. Holland, 88. We're not a poor country. We yeah. can afford to pay okay, more. Okay, take your point. But Patrick, if that is the case, not if, because obviously your facts are right. But why in that case, why hasn't the market for organic food in this country increased the way you expected it to increase 30 years ago? Because the distortions are so huge and the vested interest that David Wilson uh, was referring to and others have referred to, Pavard, I'm not sure if he's still here, but he was basically saying earlier today that the, the corporate, we, we now live in a world which is, that we're, which is no longer led by politicians, it's dominated by multinational corporations who are parasitic on the food industry and who've got a tremendous control over the whole food system and the information relating to it. So the distortions, the, combine that with the distortions in the current economics and the price disparity that we have to uh, charge to make any sort of economic sense of our farming production. You know I've got a day job, and I'm a bit mad. Um, it was not enough for Henry to take it up. So you can't blame farmers for not being able to go in the direction that it would be in the interest of society to go into because they can't make any economic no, no, I, sense I, of it. I, I, I completely understand that. One, yeah. yeah, I was just going to say, there needs, I mean, you know, the, we, we've been discussing that, that you know, better healthier and environmentally friendly food could or shouldn't cost more or, you know, whether people have to pay more for it or not. But I would say, if you look at the natural variation in how we produce, um, if you look at beef, for example, beef produced in South America creates um, uh, externalities 20 times the size of the revenue of the beef industry in South America. Um, on average... Let me, let me just interrupt you one second and ask you to use a phrase that has a fighting chance of being understood by people outside this room, yeah. you know, um, carries externality. I mean, just, okay. just put that you in. You pay in. 19 times more for your beef burger in South America if you paid the environmental cost. Right. And what's the equivalent figure in uh, the beef burger produced in this country? Say two times. Twice. But the point is there's variation in how we produce anyway. Forget about whether you call it organic or not. There's huge variation in practice. And so, actually, if you examine that variation in practice, my proposition is it shouldn't cost you more to put something on the shelf that has some variation from the business as usual. So what if you, as a mother, could go and buy your, whatever it is, beef or, or milk or whatever it might be, and actually this one is 30% better for the planet than this one, just through natural variation in practice. Then you would encourage people to shop in a certain way. So if you do what? So, so, the, so the mother goes into the shop and what happens? What? Well, there is natural variation in how things are produced. There's also variation in farming practices, there's a variation oh, yeah. in how people uh, manage well, So land. she'd be faced with a range of beef burgers? Yes, and one of them would say, actually this one's 30% better for the planet. All of them are the same price. I think that's the critical point. They're all the same price? Yeah, because the point is, today they are all the same price on the shelf. There's variation in commodities, there's a variation in produce that's issued to the shelf, and yet it's all the same price. Makes sense to you, Henry? You're furrowing well, your I, brow. I, I just can't, I can't really get that they're going to be the same price. Because, I mean, you know, how much horse meat's in one of them? I don't know. Right. <laughs> yeah. Precisely. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to make a comment about um, a question something would that be was better, said. But go on. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm just going to stick my ten pen thin anyway. <laughs> about organic food being expensive, because um, the year I got married, um, I lived in Reading. We had a fantastic organisation. Look, can I be horribly rude? I think honestly that, that everybody understands the argument about organic food and cost. If you could move it on to what we're talking about, it would be good. I mean, you don't need to persuade anybody in this room, not even me, believe it or not. Oh, no, but, my uh, point is talking about supermarkets, because it was an independent little organisation. My husband and I had a combined income of about £23,000, because I was a full-time student and he worked for a charity. We had to pay taxes as well. And we spent less on our weekly shop, shopping at a little cooperative, than we do now at the supermarket. Yeah. So yeah. the point is that there, is, there are costs incorporated in buying from a supermarket. Yeah, no, no, compliant. So the problem is not necessarily with organic food, it's with the way we buy our food. Yeah, and I try never to set foot in a supermarket, but there we are. Um, yeah. I'm afraid mine isn't a question either, but it's, pulling, it's about a couple of comments, putting together a couple of threads. So 
Earlier in the day, I think it was Tim Lang was asking, how do we persuade people to buy better food? Um, and I think maybe my, my suggestion is that we approach it from an angle of having empathy and recognizing that the hard working, whatever you, the expression is, everyone wants to be healthy. And including those who aren't even, aren't even working, particularly those who aren't working. Now, if you actually present it in a form of, we want you to be healthy, we want a healthy world. That's what they did for years and still are doing in the Soul Association. Well, I'm afraid it didn't, there was that added cost and that, and it didn't reach the sort of people I'm talking about. I'm talking about people who I know and if they have, you, if you, if it's more of an approach of, okay, we haven't got all, we cannot provide everything. We've got to be honest about this. But if we have some land and we grow our own food, if people do grow more of their own food, and as things get tighter, people are more inclined to do that, then they notice the difference in their health. And I know people who are doing this, people who, have, who really can't afford to pay any more than that. But then because they're growing more of their own food, they value good food that much yeah, better. Yeah, but if you live in a flat in the middle of Manchester, you can't do that, can you? I know. I'm quite aware of that. But it's you've got to start somewhere. Now, you can have city, city farms and things like that. But if you start creating a shift in the mindset where it's possible to, then it's just a suggestion that that is a way to start. Can I just make a small point here? I do think um, that that's patronising. I mean, my, I, I come from a, uh, an inner city working class family um, and we had absolutely no money at all at times. Um, we grew what we could in, in, a, in, in a tiny back patch of ground. And, and my, the old man had my father had an allotment. Yes. And that's what working class families did. Yes. And they know every bit as much about what you're talking about, I suspect, as you do or I do, certainly, or even they do, because they've done it, they've lived it. And it died out, and it died out because they rather liked the idea of being going, don't go to the supermarket and buy what they regard, whether you regard it here or not as cheap food. And you've got to do a hell of a thing. I mean, how you crack that? Well, the is that now they cannot afford to feed themselves. There are a lot of people now who cannot afford yeah, to feed themselves. Yeah, but they haven't got the, you know, if you looked at what's happened to allotments in this country, they're disappearing. They're all being, yeah, well, you know, they're... Well, okay, people can't actually get allotments. No, that's what I've told you. That's what yeah. I just said. Exactly, absolutely right. Yeah. What I'm saying is people, if people can grow more of their own food, yeah, then they'll they, value it. If, if they can, that would be great. Yeah. But... I think you're, you're 100% right. And the, First the, time anyone said that to me uh, You today. are, That's you are. Right. Because the truth <laughs> is, every single person would rather do the easiest thing for them, because we're all busy. I mean, every human on the planet is. And so, of course, the barriers that we're up against of the existing system are so high. But the existing system is built on fallacy. And, and that's what we're all here talking about, right? OK, I know you know that. The, the thing is, in order to change some of those fundamental fallacies, we first of all have to have really good data, and we have to have a really smart way to make a case to some people who are way more powerful outside of this room to help us to right some of those fallacies. Except and they wouldn't want the gift, Patrick's right, or whoever it was who said there's a conspiracy out there, lots of you, I think. Mm. Um, it's not data they, they need, they know it. I mean, if there is a conspiracy, they're as well aware of it as anybody in this room, and they rather like it the way it is because the conspiracy enables them to make lots of money. I don't I mean, think it's a conspiracy. There's you don't a lot, think it's There's a huge amount of vested interest. But for me, one of the big things about today was what Mike Clark said. He said, we need a new narrative and the present food system is broken. And, and for the chief executive of an organization with whatever it is, 1.2 million members, to say that suggests that the conditions now, which weren't around 30 years ago, for the emergence of some kind of new alliance. And in the end, people power is going to be more important What's than corporate power. What's different now from 30 years ago? I think there's an awareness now, and you should ask these people, not me, that things have got so serious that, that there needs to be systemic change in the way that we, we organise our food systems in such a way that they better serve the public interest, because they're not serving the public interest. And, the and, and when you say things have got so serious... In, 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 2010, in 2010, 30 years after 1980, where the entire obesity graph started in 1980, in 2010, there were a billion people hungry and a billion people overweight. Today, there's maybe slightly less than a billion people hungry and 1.5 billion people overweight. And I think that data has actually gotten 
quite widely distributed. I'm not sure what that's got to do with food production, really. Everything. <laughs> it's got to do with choice, hasn't it? Nope. No. That's no. Th you, thank you, you for telling me. You want to go back me. to Pete Myers again, who no, explained that. All right. Yeah. Maybe you don't. I, I've got a question, actually. Um, in the media over the last couple of years, there's been an awful lot about um, food poverty, We're talking about food pricing, talk about food poverty, and there's, there's hundreds of food banks now all over the UK. And I just wondered what the panel thought about that phenomenon, the rise of those, and the quality of the food that those people have probably got the least choice in society are actually um, uh, receiving. I'm happy to jump in all the time. I mean, I, I, the, the, the point, the reason we're here is that choice is a fallacy. Because unfortunately for people who have limited resources all over the world, not only here in, in, in wealthy countries, the poor of the wealthy countries, but also the poor of the poor countries, the, the, there is really no choice. Because choice has been dictated by much greater forces. Choice has been dictated by the corn commodities market. Or by, or by the fact that you know, the, the, the inputs in agriculture are not really accounted for in the price, and, and the water degradation is not accounted for. I mean, that's not really choice. And that's really hurting, especially the poorest of, of, among us, who want to feed themselves, who don't want to be fed by us. And, and, and I think, I mean, again, we're, we're building this entire system on a lack of information. Choice requires information. And there's really not good information for people to make rational choices in this current economy. But isn't that your fault, collectively? Hey, yeah. look, I'm only 33. Yeah. It's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Are you aware of the extent of the power of uh, supermarket buyers in manipulating markets? Yes. Good. I've got. Oh, what do the, you expect me to say to that question? Well, you asked. You wanted questions. You didn't want stories. Do you, want but I wanted tell, do you want me to tell you about the organic cheese factory no, I'm, no, that I'm we actually set gonna... up 30 years ago? At least I put no. some money into it, and it got stuffed because of the of the food market. The, the, the supermarket no. said they anyway. It's uh, yeah. Of course I, I I'm had aware no, of it. God I, sake. I had, right. When. When supermarkets order up, when, when supermarkets place no, no, their no, orders... No, you're not no. trying to persuade me. The purpose of this right. is not trying to convert me. I am converted, all right? I am playing devil's bloody advocate here. <laughs> OK. Jesus wept. I mean, right. honestly... Well, I wanted to, I wanted I to raise... I am asking questions that I hope are provocative and sometimes difficult and maybe sometimes stupid, because, you know, that's what I do. But you're not here to convert me. You're wasting our time. No. Don't I try wanted and convert to raise, me. I wanted to raise the guy who really, plowed in 60 acres Don't try and convert me. You don't need to do that. He'll tell you. Can 60 I just acres of college. Yeah, go on. Yeah. It seems yeah. to me that this session is not really feeding... Uh, the work of what we're all here to do. Right, tell me what you want to do. There are, there are more and more people sort of wondering what the hell is going on here right. in what has been a fantastic, inspiring day. Tell me what we you want know, to do. We know how much work we've got to do, and we've had some very well, eminent... Tell me what we, you want listen, to do. Listen for a second. Just listen for a second. <laughs> we've had some very eminent speakers all day who have helped to contribute to a very profound and important piece of work that we are all buying into. And I don't think that this particular part of this debate and discussion is doing us any favours. And I'm sorry, but I'm leaving. Nope. <laughs> well, <laughs> well that, that is one more deal. Patrick. Pa you want? Well, I, well, I don't know what the question was, but, but what is, whatever it is. supermarket buyers and what it's done to British farming. You're right. Well, there we are, panel. Do we all agree with that? They always say that the, the, the best day of your life is when you get the supermarket contract and the worst day of your life. Because, <laughs> you know, it, it's, one of, it's one of those... I, mean, I, I thought the I'm last question was about it. food banks, I'm afraid. I'm sorry, I may, I may be one behind in that case. No, I've taken it that you all assume that the supermarket... I'm not a, super, I'm not a super, supermarket supplier. No. You're not? No. Uh. I mean, can, can, I, can I just say that um, uh, yeah, I would agree. I, I would agree with the comments that have just been said, but I'd just offer a whiff of optimism about the role of markets as well as the power, the negative power of markets. So we, we all know the negative power of buyers, um, especially monopoly buyers. But today, there was a very important announcement. So the chief executive of Wilmar, uh, for those of you who don't know who Wilmar is, is Wilmar is a palm oil company um, listed in, on the Singapore Stock Exchange. And they control about 45% of the trade and, and production of palm oil. 
So one or two products being on your supermarket shelves coming from palm oil or containing palm oil. And palm oil contributing amongst four other commodities, three other commodities, beef, pulp and paper and soy, to 50% of deforestation of valuable um, tropical forests, right? So they have just committed to sustainably producing palm oil in a way that does not cause deforestation. Under pressure from Unilever, who, guess what, is under pressure from their buyers. So as a sort of positive with in the room, if you like, as a power of markets, I think that's one thing. And, and why did Unilever do what it did? Unilever did it because it believes in the future buying power of the people that are going to buy its products. It believes it's going to have a competitive advantage in the future. I don't represent Unilever, but this is what they but, said. But you're suggesting that Unilever is, and uh, this is not an outside test of you. Enlightened you're, you're, self-interest. Uh, enlightened self-interest. Yeah. And why did they develop that enlightened? What, what caused them to take that step? I mean, uh, because... Uh, uh, my, my personal huh? view is two things. One, they have an enlightened chief executive. And two, which is necessary for, for change in organizations, I believe, but also, too, they, they came to realize with the adequate level of data about how commodities are produced that they can save millions, hundreds of millions, by sourcing commodities in a more sustainable way from places where water is less of a risk. There's a hundred times difference between the production of cotton in Pakistan and the production of cotton in certain right. places okay. in the United States. So, so given that, isn't the answer, based on that, part of the answer, based on that, that instead of... Um, approaching the Unilevers of this world, the great conglomerates, as the enemy, you approach them in a collegial way yes, and say, to use a fashionable phrase at the moment, we're all in this together, let's all work together, as opposed to this confrontational approach, which in the end, they're going to win. Yeah, because the fact is, I think a lot of them do know that food will become more expensive as demand increases and supply shrinks, and we will need different ways of producing food. And we will need more sustainable ways of producing food because ecological intensification, we heard today, increases yield. Mm. So actually, um, ecological, an ecologically appropriate approach to food production will increase yield, which will actually compete against non-sustainable, unsustainable food production in a way that will make it cheaper over time. We've heard that from Sekem, an Egyptian farmer today. So I, that's, that's what the, why I think they're acting in that uh, way. P Peter. There's only one threat, and that is from the CEO from Unilever himself. If I make two quarters, not the results shareholders expect, I'm out with my program. So we have to then look at the whole financial system and actually from the other side, where we are pensioners and investors in Unilever, he wants the right shareholders to back him up in that long-term policy. So the big companies only can survive in this when we, on the other side, as investors, and we are also investors, really secure that. If we don't, and we leave it to the guys behind the screens and go in and go out, then it doesn't work in the end. So that, that's the bigger picture. Maybe too big for here now, but otherwise I don't think it is real sustainable in the long term. There's another view of this, though, using this, again, the market framework, and that's the view of creative destruction. And one of the answers to the supermarket question is actually that the supermarket is a 100-year-old innovation that was invented and could be reinvented. It could go away. And if you actually look at what's happening in Silicon Valley, again, back to my lovely cell phone analogy that you didn't like, um, but, but, that, but that in the same place that, that incredible innovation is happening, and we're all using all of their technologies, there's parallel technologies in food system change. There's entirely new ways of buying food. In New York City apartment buildings today, ap apartment buildings are being built with refrigerators on the first floor. Why? Because people are actually not going to the supermarket. They're buying their food online and having it sent directly to their building and having it waiting for them when they come home. So what if the supermarket is an old innovation that's completely broken apart and creative destruction works and entirely new ways of buying food exist and they're better and they connect people directly to farmers? I want to make a comment about that rather heated exchange with Phil Horton, who, who then left. Um, I want to let you off the hook, then put you back on it again. <laughs> um, <laughs> because we had a conversation before this event, and, and you know, John said to me, why, aren't, why isn't the panel more balanced? And the honest answer is because we couldn't get the people that we wanted to come. I said that earlier. So you obviously have to play devil's advocate. 
so because you're forced to, because we're all, you know, we're on the, on the, on the same side, so what are you going to do except play the devil's advocate? But I do think there's something behind this, which is that my perception is that the media are like a pack, of course, excluding you. They tend to just follow the status quo, and actually, it's a brave person in the media who challenges the kind of policy line on stuff. And the truth is that everybody is like, as I gave the, you know, the thing this morning about everybody being asleep, and I think the media are asleep about this. I don't think there are very, very many people in the media who are awake enough to realize the, the seriousness of the challenge that's in front of us. And you, because you have a very prominent role in the media, have an opportunity to raise the level of this. And I know you just, you, you have to give us a hard time, and that's right. So I'm not asking for any mercy. I'm simply saying that this, in the perception of the people here, and there's some leaders here, is a critically important issue, and it does need to be taken more seriously than mm, it has been I, recently. I, 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 think, I think you confuse what the media is about. It's uh, certainly what people like I am about. And, and what I'm about is asking questions. And if oh. people like your friend who decided to stomp out doesn't like the question, well, that's fine. Mm. Yeah, that's, I, I, that's, I agree. That, that's, that's, fine, that's his yeah. choice. But yeah. I'm, I'm going to... And, and, and the other mistake you make, I think, is to believe that the media is monolithic. It isn't. I mean, if you, if you compare a newspaper that I suspect most of you do not read every day with avid enthusiasm, and that is the Daily Mail, um, the fact is it has been incredibly supportive of your GM campaign, yeah, yeah. or was for, for many years and still is. Uh, it coined the phrase, didn't it? Frankenfood. Hugely helpful to you in all sorts of ways if you've been able to capitalise on it because for all sorts of reasons. Anyway, uh, so the media isn't monolithic. And no. the BBC is certainly not monolithic. I, I, if it is, I have no idea what its view no, it's is. No, it's not monolithic, but there's like a party line which no, kind isn't. of is... A no, 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 it's no. not. And I don't mean it's dictated. I mean it's adopted uh, by... Whom? by it finds a certain level, and I think there's a slight complacency about the media. Uh, it's called certainly... tapping into public opinion. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Well, maybe well, that's all I'm saying. Well, yeah, there's the, and there's a reason for that public yeah. opinion. Anyway, yeah. yes. My question follows directly from that, actually, because I do think the media has an enormous role to play. Clearly, we have to raise awareness about these issues. You blamed us for not getting our message out there. Well, I'd like to come back to you and the BBC Farming Today programme this oh, morning, speak for the Farming which Today programme. chose to publicise selling ch Welsh chickens to China rather than this uh, conference today. Well, I, the yeah, issues I, I, I that it can't raises. answer that. I take your point, but I can't answer the question because I have nothing to do with them. Also, all. I think you're rather patronising about young mums, and I do think they have brains as well as pockets. And I do think one thing that concerns them even more than the immediate amount of coins in their pocket is the future of their children. And the future of their children is impacted by the state of nature and the world around us and their health, the children's health in the future, which all these issues tell us will be badly affected if we carry on the way we do. Yeah. Comment. Um, this leads directly on from what this, the woman was saying about um, people wanting a healthy choice and thinking about the welfare of their children as well as about the cost. And that is that maybe we should think about pushing for... We heard a lot of this morning about uh, chemicals which are used to produce food which make the food harmful. Those toxic effects should be clearly labelled on the food. Then at least the organic movement will be playing on a level playing field. All right. Very, just 30 seconds from each of you, if we can, because we're just about out of time, but, but go on. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if the panel could quickly comment on um, the labor required for, um, I guess, quote-unquote, sustainable food system, because where I come from in Canada, the average age of farmers is retirement age right now, and we will... 80% of farmers will retire um, in the next 10 years. And if you actually want us to have more, you know, uh, small farms in the future for a more sustainable future, um, do you think that there is enough momentum, although we do see small farms coming up, is that enough to meet the needs um, of the future? Uh, anybody want a quick comment on that? Not all of you, but a quick comment, Henry? The, the average age of farmers is said to be 59. I used to think that was jolly old, but it's uh, looking, <laughs> look, looking younger, right? <laughs> All I can tell you about, about, about the size of farms is ever since I've been farming, farms have been getting bigger. Yeah. And it's just a classic case of, yeah. of I, I mean, you can't buck the economics of it. You just have to have a bigger area to, to, to grow the food over. Yeah. Yep. Quick one. Thank you. Yeah. 
Um, we've, we've heard a lot today about uh, big companies and, and the problems associated with them. But ultimately, I think the, uh, the consumer, when they go shopping, um, has the, the power in the end. So it becomes an educational uh, question, I yep. think. And um, the case with battery chickens would be an example. We, you know, 30 years ago, most chickens were in batteries, and now they're not. So yeah, it's I a think, good illustration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, very, very quick, if you wouldn't mind, because we yeah, are... Yeah, thank you very much. Um, it's about poverty. It's not about food poverty, and that it means it's about distribution of wealth and power. And focusing on the price of food is a mistake. We should be looking at where subsidies go and how you do systematic changes that empower and enrich the poor so they can not have the choices that you're talking I, about. Can I... Do you mind very much? Sorry, yeah. forgive me. You're absolutely right, of course, but it's not what we're here to talk about now. Because we, this conference, with the best will in the world and at a risk, the risk of making myself on public air, is not going to affect the distribution of wealth, at least. I don't think that's what you're here to do. Through agricultural subsidies, that is but on the agenda. You're right. wrong, Mr Humphreys, you're completely wrong. Second, two questions. What's the don't role for transparent pricing no, no, no and more. land reform no. in the UK? If Sorry, you want sir. more people into agriculture, you have to have land reform and get a lot of young people in. Right, thank you. Uh. Hi, John. Tracy Worcester from The Pig Ask. Many, many people say to me that they would like to buy high welfare meat, but it's more expensive, and what difference does it make if I do it on my own? So we've launched a global campaign called The Pig Ask, where we've got partnerships across the world, and Ellen, you I know are a partner, along with Compassion and World Farming and the Soil Association. Please, we need partners to get this message out via the internet, which we were talking about earlier, and via the press, people out there are ready for change. So please join us with the pig ask. Look it up on the internet or get a card from me. Thanks, Tracy. And last, last comment from this young lady. Yeah. Um, hello, my name is Maat at Nkemi, um, and I'm 11 years old. <coughs> and I was worried about um, these externalities because it means if things don't change, you're taking my future away. Why didn't we talk about action? Yeah. <laughs> right. You've, uh, you've, you've, you've now got a chance in the last five minutes to talk about action. If each of you could throw a magic switch tomorrow, and I'm looking at you, Peter, because I'm going to go like that, and do something to deal with what we've been talking about, that we've been talking about quite a lot in different ways, but nonetheless, you know where we're heading. What would you do? Well, I would uh, go back to my uh, staff in the bank and ask uh, if we can have another view on what uh, we do in sustainable farming, and if we can sort of take some of the, the facts I heard here uh, and, and, and the evidence is there uh, into our day-to-day -day practice. At the same time, I see also a case for bringing more of the benefits of the sort of long-term benefits of uh, sustainable farming, sustainable food to, to, a, to, to, to the scientific circles, to the, to the government, to make the case this is interesting for you to look at. We are happy to finance it but you have to endorse it also from a governmental point of view. Mm. And that's what I would like to do, and I'm very encouraged by what I heard today. Good. Yep, Henry? I'd make a plea for more and better and better funded independent science. The next, the next, the next, mm. the next lot of this, the next problems of this is going to have to be solved by proper independent-led scientific advice. We really need that. The last, food, the last Green Revolution caused quite a lot of problems, but it did solve the immediate hunger that was faced. We've now got a different set of problems to solve. We won't get them solved without science. Yeah. Helen? I was actually going to say independent funding for science, too. Well, um, I, I, and I was before you. Yeah, th thanks for taking it. <laughs> but I was also going to say, I think, uh, coming from the American perspective, we should change the name of the farm bill to the food bill. And we should have a much broader group of stakeholders at the table when we're creating this legislation that has the subsidies and, and all the other sort of variables that create the, the current food system that we're in. Well, yeah. Peter? I would say get businesses to actually understand what is the true cost of food production. 
sounds very simple, but Richard, I said Peter most Ryan don't. Richardson, forgive me. Um, and I've just been in China where they have just changed a policy on air pollution because they've just understood that air pollution costs their economy 10% of GDP. So getting organizations to understand the economics, the actual Which organizations? Cost, Businesses, retailers, fast-moving consumer good companies like Unilever, all the way down to the producers. And just in a nutshell, how do you do that? You give them the right data and tools to you understand. You don't think they got it already? No. Really? No. All those clever people working for them? No. No? No. no. All right, Patrick? I agree with what Richard has said. I think we need a, uh, we need Today needs to be a launching platform for not one, but probably several new initiatives. And Pavad has, has talked about Tea for Agriculture, which is fantastic. And yesterday we talked about uh, a self-organizing working group to, to take on this challenge, the one that Richard has named. And I mean, Mike Sid, and there are all sorts of people who have said they want to work together in a new way, get out of our silos to see how we can uh, get a handle on the, the different costs, and work out what the best points of intervention, which is what was said by Guillermo yesterday, to bring about the change that's needed. And I think that this is a very optimistic event, and I think it's really good for us to have been subjected to your criticisms, because it sharpens us up. <laughs> they don't. Um, just I think they do. Just a final quick thought. How do, uh, what are you now going to do? I mean, uh, as a result of these last few days, you're going to produce a bit of paper. What are you going to do? Well, we, be, we were talking yesterday about trying to influence the Farm Bill and uh, the European Union policy, but I think that this would be work for our group to, to look at and see how we can do it. Can I ask you a question? Yes. What did you recommend in your 2002 book? What if it what? What did you recommend in your 2002 book? God knows, that's years ago, I can't remember. Yeah, but, I'm, but it might be still relevant today. Yeah. <laughs> it needs rewriting. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let him write it for me. Um, he, I can't remember, to be honest. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I remember. you remember. God help us. Ah, oh, he remembers everything. Tim, go on. Go on. Of course you do. Actually, you were very, you were very helpful. It must be said. I'm always helpful. Yeah, you are. It's true. <laughs> That's the end of my career, isn't it? Um, he said culture change. He said, what did I say? He said. You said culture change. Oh, culture change. Yeah. Oh, I still believe that. <laughs> Absolutely. Can I say also, like Patrick, I think it's good that we get these sceptical questions, because that's actually what the public is doing to us. It is good. <laughs> it is true. Thank you, Tim. It is true. It is true. It is about... Can I ask them a question? Go on. I've got the power. Uh, <laughs> what, what, what would you do about culture change? I would be hopeful about the future young people. I, I would actually be hopeful. I would say there's, you know, McDonald's admits their biggest challenge is millennials. Millennials have a lot more. Millennials, uh, people born starting from 1980, I'd like to very proudly say, until <laughs> until the mid 90s. Um, and and I and I think I think actually to Peter Seligman's point, people learning more on social media can be really terrible, but can be really great. And I I, I do think with really pointed, targeted information for this next generation, look. No young woman that I see in my general sphere is, is when they get pregnant, they start to immediately think about eating organic food. There is change at that point. We're at a really amazing moment. And I, I think the power is going to be in the next generation to do this. Sorry, guys. Go on, one, one, ten, then you got to stop. I had this argument with, or discussion with Ellen. My, go on, shout it out. You have it. Go on. This discussion with Ellen in, uh, where was it? Milan. Our general message is things getting more expensive. But actually, it's not necessarily true that they do get more expensive. We save on health care. We yeah, that, well, that point has been made, yeah, yeah. We eat differently, eat less meat, don't pay for the environment and save it, don't pay for the health care. Actually, it's not necessarily more expensive. That's one very thing. All right. But culture change is what I think all of us, to get back to Patrick's point, I think. We have got to address right. that. We, uh, unless, if Patrick is happy with that so notion, we have the thought on culture change. What we don't know quite is... is, is uh, local food. Yeah, if you can... If you can. Just 
Yep, cut out the supermarket. John, you do, you've got a few major which is, challenges. Uh, yeah, but, uh, absolutely, yeah. But, but do you think we could just, okay. sorry to jump no, in, but could we just round off with, can we just make a couple of closing remarks? Make I'm a couple, that who wants to make a couple, who's going to make well, closing remarks? I'd like to make one, and then you I are. think Ken's right. just going to say a few words, oh, right. but there's but another event in here at six, so we do no, have to round go, up. And, uh, just in terms of getting our message out there, I just, on a personal note, would like to say a huge thank you for everyone who's taken the time to live tweet and use our hashtag today, because as well as Nel Nelson Mandela not being with us anymore and Little Mix announcing their UK tour, that we had huge competition to get ourselves trending on Twitter, and this afternoon we were the second most talked about topic on the Twitter sphere. So... <laughs> We're not just talking to ourselves, we're actually talking to a really wide range of different people who are very interested in this topic. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Clen. So I, um, I guess I want to close by saying that this has been an incredible, incredible day um, and um, remind us of all the sort of breathtakingly uh, powerful presentations we've had since, uh, since morning. Uh, this has been a session on the one hand where we've been talking about some kind of brand new glossy tool that we're still not quite sure what, what we can do with it. On the other hand, you know, this has involved people who've been struggling with these issues for decades. And somehow or another, I think we've, we've, we've found a way to be together, found a way to think about how we can deal with, with deep long-term challenges at the same time, bring all of these new kind of perspectives uh, of this externalities tool, but also of social media and so on. And I think ultimately we're, we're somehow getting our hands around um, uh, simultaneously these economic and financial system changes and the cultural change, which unless they work together, we're not going to transform the, the system that we have. So um, although I was, appeared to be involved in organizing this event, I had nothing to do with organizing the event. I'm going to use that opportunity to thank uh, Sustainable Food Trust, all our speakers, all the volunteers, and everybody, and all the donors that I think Patrick has named for making this uh, uh, incredible event and for all of you to, for coming and throwing yourselves into all the questions and discussion um, today. And I would like to thank John uh, because, John, you didn't have to be here today, and, and uh, we gave you a tough time, even me, including me, and I really appreciate you coming, uh, and, of course, um, all our panel, but all the other speakers, just to add my thanks to uh, Ken. I do think that this has been a moment of history, because I think that there's never been, from, from all the events I've been to, quite a moment like this with this diversity of representation of people from all over the world in leadership positions in key areas of public health, environment, welfare, policy, all feeling that there's a need for change at the same time. So thank you very, very, very much for coming and for taking this on. This is just the beginning, as we've heard in this debate. So thank you all. Thank you particularly, John.